Namaste and welcome to this evening's Bhagavad Gita webinar. Tonight we're going to continue with chapter 18. And as we know, chapter 18 is the last chapter in the Bhagavad Gita. And so probably we'll only be having less than half a dozen more of these webinars before we're completed. But in chapter 18, uh, Krishna summarizes, you might say, many of the topics that he raises in this last chapter. He's recapitulating things that have gone before and bringing them to a summation. And even though some of these things we have covered in previous discourses, it's good that we revisit these again and uh, go over them. And uh, perhaps each time we do come back to them, we take a new perspective on them. And so this evening, I'm going to begin uh, with particularly one or two of these. Now, I warn you that this first one sounds complicated, but if we get underneath it, we see it. I'll, I'll explain what it is that we're really trying to say there. This is uh, chapter 18, and I'm going to read stanzas 14 and 15. Krishna says, The five causes of all action, of right action as well as wrong, performed by man in body, speech, and thought are as follows. The human body itself, two, the causative agent of action, three, the various instruments of action, meaning senses, minds, intellect, so forth. Four, the various kinds of action, the power of speech and the motor activities, hands and uh, feet and so on. And five, destiny, which is the influence exerted by past karmas or actions and is the presiding deity of all actions. In other words, he's saying we're being driven mostly by karma. And then finally the next stanza he says, considering how many factors are influential in human action, anyone lacking this awareness who thinks of his ego as the sole doer of everything accomplished by him shows no understanding at all. Now that sounds complicated, but it's actually not. What, what Krishna is saying here is we think we have free will to control our action. We think I do this, I do that, I make a choice, I, I have a smorgasbord of options before me, and I choose to do this. Not only do I choose these actions, I choose these thoughts as well. And thoughts are what ultimately lead to action and expression. And so all of these are at my command. But what Krishna is saying here, that everything that we do, everything that we think, it's not ours, that we're not creating these things, but we're influenced. And even influence more than thinking that I, this ego, is making this choice. So we know the ego is the soul bound. It's the soul bound by identification with the body. And some of the things he lists here are things, uh, and, and he doesn't list, but by implication, what he's saying is we're influenced. Let's look at some of the things that influence us. A person says something, or they think something, and they think it's their own thought, but really sometimes all it is is some uh, expression of their own likes and dislikes. Now that's in a way they're they're expressing uh, their own preferences in that regard. But oftentimes it's not a conscious choice. It's a compulsion. It's a compulsion of they they like something. They're addicted to something. Something is expressed uh, is come to them, or they they have a built up hatred of something. And that's they're influenced by that. Oftentimes very irrationally. And you see people coming with all coming uh, forward with all sorts of motivations of why they did why they did that or another thing, and it's it's irrational. It's just simply their their likes and dislikes and desires. Another thing is sometimes people just do things simply because of habit. They think they, a certain thought. It's as if there's a a rut in their conscious way of thinking that they just fall into that rut, and you say something to them and. They say it over again. I've known older people, particularly sometimes in the latter stages of their life, where they begin to go into a little bit of dementia. And you've you know, seen this. They tell you the same story over and over again. Or you just say one thing and the same repetitive pattern comes back again and off. Now, that's, that's an illness perhaps in the later life for some people, but some people seem to express that tendency very early in their life. They just, they've become what Paramahansa Yogananda said were psychological antiques. You know, they're no longer creative thinking. So we have habit, we have likes and dislikes, subconscious impressions. Now, this is, hits home for many of us who meditate. If you notice that when you meditate sometime, you're, 
you're meditating, you're very focused in your meditation, and all of a sudden your mind just goes off in some daydream. And you're thinking of this and some episode of something happened, and what about this, what about that? And you catch yourself, maybe minutes later, you think, what was I thinking? Where did that come from? And it was just some little impression that had been there in your did you create it? Well, you didn't really create that. It seemed to somehow come over you. And then, of course, we have the, you might say, this presiding deity that Krishna says, we have our past karma. We think we come into this life perhaps free and, and uh, without influence from the past, but we know, we study the uh, yogic teachings, that that's not the case. We come in with a great deal of burden, burden on, from past karma, uh, things that perhaps uh, are just under the surface, waiting for the right circumstance to arise. A person uh, perhaps has, has uh, this tendency from the past, the desire perhaps, wishing always to be a great artist, a performer, an actor, or something of that nature, or perhaps a sports hero. And it's under the surface, and they don't uh, express it, but all of a sudden, put themselves in the right environment and all of a sudden that karmic uh, seed becomes uh, fertilized and all of a sudden their life changes and they're off in this direction. I've seen people make drastic changes in their life and you wonder where did that come from? And all of a sudden their life has taken a left turn or right. Sometimes not to their benefit at all, but they weren't even aware what it was. All of a sudden an environment had stimulated a certain type of of thinking had come into them. And this is exactly what Paramahansa Yogananda used to say, is our, we don't create our thoughts even. We think we do, but we don't. That thoughts are universally rooted, not individually rooted. And according to our level of consciousness and our influences, the environment is another great influence. We put ourselves in one environment, and we begin to think. Certain thoughts begin to come to us. I remember a story that uh, years ago in America uh, was related to me. And it was a, uh, in the uh, grocery stores, in a very large grocery store, the, there were marketing people there doing a survey of why customers who came in were buying certain products. Was it the position on the shelf? Was it the color of the wrapper? What, what was it? Why did they buy these products? And so they were, there was a long aisle of various uh, bread that uh, different companies had put there. They had all, they were selling their bread. And there was uh, one bread brand, and this was many, many years ago. I don't know if it exists anymore, but it was a white fluffy bread, that very, you know, the cheapest type, and it was called Wonder Bread. And there was Wonder Bread was, was one of the choices that a person coming in. And so when a person would buy a loaf, uh, they would then ask if they could interview them. And, and so it is, a person bought a loaf of Wonder Bread, put it in their basket, and the person asked, interviewed them and says, now sir, why is it that, uh, did you buy this Wonder Bread because of uh, you, where it was on the shelf? Or did you buy it uh, uh, because you had seen the advertising for it? Or, or what was it exactly? And the man says, oh no, 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 I didn't none of those reasons. I bought Wonder Bread because it builds strong bodies in 12 ways, which is exactly the advertising motto of that bread. I, Wonder Bread builds strong bodies in 12 ways. That, I bought it because of that. And of course, he thought that was his own thought, that it built strong bodies, but he was influenced by the ad. And without really thinking. Of course, this is a advertiser's dream. They want us to, they want to implant those little thoughts in our mind, and we think that there are thoughts. This is why I'm buying them. But really, you bought those Nike shoes, or you bought the, you bought those, uh, that, uh, that brand name uh, iPhone, or iPhone, Samsung phone, whatever it might be, because of, you thought of it. But no, you're, you're influenced by that. Well, this is, this is not good or bad. This is just the way it is. The ideally, of course, we want to make informed decisions. And knowing this, that, oh, I'm influenced, gives us a certain perspective. And I think this is one of the first lessons that we should learn, is that, yes, I am, I am influenced. And knowing that and recognizing that leads us to the next possible outcome is, well, if that is so, why not choose 
my influences. You see, I can choose that which is going to influence me in the direction that I want to go. And I'll find, if I want to change my thoughts, put myself in an environment, and different thoughts will begin to come to me. Different influences will affect my actions. And yes, I may, I may, I may recognize they're not really all my own, but I do have a part to play in it. Some people thinking, well, I'm being influenced by all these outside actions. I shouldn't do anything. I'm a, they become afraid to act, in other words, because maybe I'll do the wrong thing. Maybe uh, anything I do is, is not going to be, it's going to be somebody else's influence on me. And so they become very hesitant and paralyzed. And we can't take that position either. It's not like we may be... Yes, uh, somebody may say we're puppets to what's going on about us, but we're not 100% puppets. We do have a role to play. Uh, and, and which brings me that story of Swami Kriyananda when he was early in his discipleship uh, with Paramahansa Yogananda. He was asked to, uh, Yogananda saw that he had a propensity for being able to present uh, his teachings in a good manner. And so he was appointed as one of the uh, ministers of one of the churches or present, doing presentations of Sunday satsangs and that sort of thing. And so Swamiji uh, took that duty on, but he began to think about this. I don't want to just give these people out there my personal opinions about this. I mean, I. We don't want to have, I'm the doer, we want to overcome that. It's God that we're taught to, that should be the doer of what we're presenting. And I want God to speak through me to, and not have, you know, me, Swami Kriyananda or J. Donald Walters, as he was in those days, be the one that's giving this. And I think many people who have been in that position probably have had some similar thoughts. How can I get out of the way, with this little ego out of the way? And uh, so he decided one day to do an experiment, and this was at a, a, a large function, a Sunday satsang, and he was the chief speaker. And so he, he was in front and he began to speak and he, at first, and then in the middle of his discourse, he stopped. And he just remained silent, remained silent. And in his mind, he thought, well, God, I want you to speak through me. I'm going to take myself out of the way and you speak through me. And so he stopped speaking and he didn't say anything. And now he says in telling this story, he said he didn't speak for two minutes. Now that's a long time if you're up in front of an audience. So maybe he was ex exaggerating a little bit, I don't know. But he said during his silence, he looked out at the audience and he, and he saw that as the time extended that the audience was become very uncomfortable. I mean, the people, some of the other uh, disciples there were becoming very nervous and thinking that he had frozen and then he had stage fright and he had frozen up and he didn't know what to say and they were becoming very embarrassed for him. And he saw the audience too was becoming uh, tense. But he said he stuck with it. He, he just remained silent. God, I want you to speak through me. And after a suitable period of time, he realized that God was not going to speak through him. In other words, he wasn't going to become a medium for some spirit, you might say, to take possession of him and to use him as a medium, as sometimes psychic people uh, sometimes claim to do. That wasn't the way it works. And so he, after a suitable period of time, he began to continue with his discourse, and I'm sure he continued using that theme of why he didn't say anything, that we must be the actor. We must act. We have to do it. Now, we are taught that I don't want to be the doer. God, you be the doer. But yet God works in this world, not in a direct fashion as using people as mediums, but God works through instruments. That we must be the instrument and we must position ourselves so that we're, we invite God's presence to flow through us to the highest degree possible. You see, one of the principles is that so long as we're embodied in this physical form, so long as we have these instruments of intelligence, intellect, uh, ego, intuition, so long as we're working through those and we're embodied in this way, bound as we are, 
we are compelled to act. We have to act. There's no such thing as inaction, and so we have to act. And realizing that, we have to act in the highest way possible. Even if it is, we realize, well, there is a bit of ego here speaking, because I'm not 100% free. But yet, we try to raise our consciousness to the highest level possible to be influenced, to choose our influence. Now, the Gita goes on in the next couple of stanzas to talk about the different types of influence. There's sattvic influence, we can be under the rajasic influence, we can be under tamasic influence. And to the, to the extent that we uplift our consciousness to be able to be influenced by higher forces, you might say higher thoughts, or higher, higher consciousness, will begin to manifest and become a channel for that. So we can't abandon ship, you might say. We have to take command of the ship to the best degree possible and steer it in the most positive direction possible, trying to, at the same time, draw down that divine influence to the highest degree we can. And so Swami continued on with that, trying to be an influence, inf a positive influence. So we cannot, we are influenced, but yet at the same time we have to retain and assume the responsibility and be able to take that responsibility and act to the highest level possible in this world. Now, we will be influenced by the past. You could say our karma, all of these things outside of ourselves. In the process of acting, the direction of our acting is taking those actions in life that point us in a, direct, in a direction that overcomes the bondage that is binding us. You could say that's the right action to take for any, any of us. Whatever level we're on, something that leads us to that light, you might say, the light of freedom. And if it's in that direction, then we're moving in the right direction. Eventually, of course, we want to attain that freedom. And that is the goal of all of us on the spirit, in the spiritual life. It's not just us in the spiritual life. It's this, this is the goal of all, uh, all souls. Is, it's to uplift oneself to the point from bondage to freedom. Ego bondage, identity, and to freedom. Now, it's not the first uh, task of all souls to overcome, to attain liberation. Now, eventually, of course, we're moving in that direction, but before liberation comes enlightenment, in other words, let us stop making new karma. Yes, we still have old karma, so, but don't worry about that. Many people sometimes, as they come onto the spiritual life, the yogic life, and they're, they, real, they come to realize that, yes, they are influenced. All of this past karma is influencing them. And so they focus their life on getting rid of the past karma, not being influenced by it. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but more useful, because as much effort as we go into working out past karma, oftentimes just as much energy is going into creating new karma. So you people, you see people, the, the scales of karma are like a, a pendulum. And so they're trying to stop the pendulum on one side, but all they're doing is pushing it in the other direction and creating new karma. So it's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I mean, that's what we, I mean, we want to obviously moderate the effects of our past karma, but our real solution here is yes, while we're doing that, is it, is, let's, put our attention on the cessation of creating new karma. And that's, you know, that's, you, that will be the ultimate solution. And this, of course, is known if we can do that, if we can overcome the ego active principle within us, overcome the ego of bondage, that ego attachment, we then find ourselves working in this world in a way that does not create new karma. And little by little, we work out the past. And that's that's the direction that we we go in order to ultimately free ourselves. The Hiri Mahashai said a very um, inspiring uh, phrase in the autobiography of a yogi. He's quoted as saying, "He said, as long as we breathe the free air 
of this world, of this earth, we are obligated to render back grateful service. So in other words, as long as we're breathing fear of this earth, we have to give service. In other words, we have to return. As long as we're here working and acting in this world, we have a karmic obligation to, to return gratefully service back. Now, but there's a, if you look at, listen to that phrase, there's a little bit more esoteric meaning to that as well. As long as we're breathing the free air, in other words, as long as, and that's what that is saying on a deeper level is, as long as we are ego-bound, because as long as there's a relationship between ego-bound and our breath, the breathing of the, the, the necessity to breathe. Now it's, uh, it's said in the yogic tradition that freedom from ego bondage is related to breath mastery. Now it's not so much, let's not focus so much on the breath, physical inhaling, exhaling, because the breath is but representative of uh, the life force within us. And so you could say, as long as we are subject and not a master of our own life force, we find ourselves in the kar in karmic bondage. And as long as we are in karmic bondage, we are compelled to act appropriately, wisely, and give service, give action in this world. And only when we master the life force within ourselves, it's only then when we can withdraw that life force that then we're no longer compelled by the karmic uh, cause and effect uh, uh, we're not creating that karma anymore, and then we're free from that compulsion. Now, of course, we're still going to give, give grateful service, but the compulsion is no longer there. And so this is, you might say, a little deeper uh, under the surface uh, uh, meaning there that this is what our job should be on a spiritual life, is to become masters of ourselves. And this, you could say, is the definition of what it is to practice Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga is the science of learning to become masters of ourself, learning to come, become masters of our life force, which is representative of ourselves. And through the, through the control of that life force, we begin to become uh, aware of our, our, our deeper nature. We learn to withdraw that life force and then to direct that life force up the spine toward the brain. And this is the, this is the deeper path that all souls are traveling. All religions at their source have this purpose, is in order is to uplift consciousness up to the brain, up that, that physical God, that life force within us, up to the spiritual eye and up to the brain. And, and it's expressed, religion expresses outwardly in terms of ritual, expresses outwardly in terms of symbolic gestures, but these all are outward, outward symbols of what is happening within ourselves. To withdraw that life force away from the outer fringes of, of the body back into the spine to uplift this up to the brain. And this is, this is the spiritual path. And the practice of Kriya Yoga approaches this very directly, not indirectly. But it begins by learning to become aware. Control is always preceded by awareness. So we become aware. And one of the first things to become aware is we, what is it that's influencing us? And then being wise enough to be able to choose those influences. Now, that seems easy, but anybody who is trying to do that seriously realizes that this takes a great deal of self-control and it, it's the development of the will to be able to make the right choice in each moment. A choice to be able to move toward the light or toward the darkness. And so this is this is the fundamental beginning point, learning to develop the will and then using that will to make good choices, particularly choosing that which influences us. Choosing our environment, choosing our friends, choosing the things we read, the music, the, the music that we listen to, choosing, choosing to the, whatever degree we can our influences so that we can then become a channel for positive 
thoughts, positive actions. So many blessings to you. Thank you for joining us this evening. And we will, I invite you again to tune in again next Friday evening for uh, this Bhagavad Gita webinar.